with a lot of presentations, I always prepare in advance and, and try to get everything in the presentation in my brain so I've got it there and I can just have a natural sort of comfortable presentation. And then along comes sugardaddy.com. And you know, it, all my preparation just sort of goes out the window, but we'll, we'll try to suffer through it. Um, actually, in my talk, you're going to get a twofer. It's, it's actually two presentations in one. I'm going to talk about data as code and then turn that around and talk about code as data. Now, what we're specifically talking about here uh, is, let me back up, um, a definition. I'll take a definition of each one. So if you talk about code as data, that's taking a very large batch of code, a large application with thousands or millions of lines associated with it, and treating that in and of itself as data. You know, we, we all work with data, right? But we work with things like customer records or orders in a supply chain. We don't normally think about code itself as being data. But when we do that, we can find some very interesting uh, things that come as a, as a result of that. The second part of that is data now as code. So think of a bunch of code fragments, thousands, millions of code fragments that are in some kind of searchable repository that can then be recalled and executed. That also presents uh, sort of some interesting ramifications as well. So let me, uh, let me walk through this and see what it, what it might mean. So let me take the first part of that which is code as data. Um, that is a large code base. Yes. Ah, yes. Certainly can do that. 150. Is that, is that good enough for everybody? Can you all see that? Great. OK. So when you think about code, when you attack code, um, and you just look at it, uh, and he, just here, this is a snippet of some code that we wrote recently in a, in a forecasting model. Um, you can say, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break all this code up into everything that's between some kind of delimiter. Uh, in the Wolfram language, it's, it's a semicolon. But it does lend itself. It does lend itself to the decomposition uh, by, uh, by some structure, the, some structure that then we could attack. Um, now, the reason we were sort of inspired to think about code as data was an actual project that we were doing for a financial services firm. This financial services firm had purchased another similar financial services firm. Their code base had been written outside of the United States. It was millions of lines of code. And they were concerned about, okay, what am I getting? What am I buying? Am I, uh, are there vulnerabilities in this this code that we, uh, that we inherited by virtue of this merger. So part of our assignment was to then take a look at that, that code and the features of this code uh, to see what we could find. So here, hence the question, so what do you get when you, when you do this, when you treat code as data? Um, so some of the things that we looked for, and I'll blow this up so you can see this as well, <clears throat> is certain patterns. So one of the first things that we did was we said, all right, well, there, there is a graph. Um, it's not scrolling for me. Uh, there's a graph of the data. Why is this not working? OK, I'll do it this way. Um, so this is all the functions uh, are represented as nodes. And if they call another function, that's represented as an edge um, uh, associated with the, the two nodes. So you can, you can use this to look at certain uh, redundancies. You can look at um, you know, sort of almost like a, a, lean, um, a lean thinking kind of idea where you want your code to be as efficient as possible. But if there are all of these kinds of connections, they present a pattern that uh, might suggest some code inefficiencies. There's also the idea of bottlenecks. So uh, let's see if I run that. I can open up some code that uh, where we were looking at some of these bottlenecks, I had to uh, take a couple of things out of this. <clears throat> but um, we did look at how many user-defined functions there were as opposed to built-in functions. So this is, and you're not going to be able to read this, and it doesn't matter that you can read this, but we took a batch of code and we, uh, we highlighted 
in blue, the user defined functions, and in red, these were the Wolfram language functions, and certain bunches of Wolf, strings of Wolfram language functions had implications, certain bunches of, of uh, patterns in user defined functions also had implications as to the structure of this code. Um, so we could, reveal, we could use the Wolfram language with all of its power and capability to visualize you know, any kind of scientific phenomena. We could train that same power onto code. There was another aspect, and I, I, I won't go into the technical details here, I'm happy to answer questions, but we were sort of looking at nesting. There was a sort of a nesting structure that was in place, and so we were able to, to visualize that with, uh, with a 2D graph and, and then break all of that down. So it was, it was quite illuminating to uh, look at this code and to then report back to the company that hired us that, look, we found this, these patterns in the code. We found this evidence of malicious elements or inefficient elements in the code. Um, but, you know, it got us thinking after that project about, you know, well, let's broaden our definition of what code is. Let's think about uh, contracts, you know, legal contracts. I mean, that essentially is much, you know, the, the work that you do in breaking down code is similar to the work that you might do in breaking down a legal contract and making it computable. So um, we, along comes a, a company that uh, is in the oil field service business. So let me, let me tell you this story. They uh, came to us and they said, look, we, we drill oil wells for a living and uh, we want to know how much money we're making day by day, literally hour by hour. Um, and we said, okay, well, why is that a big deal? That should be easy. Well, it's not a big deal. When they showed me the contract between the oil field service company and their client, who was the national oil company, this happened to be Pemex, um, the, the contract was about that thick, and it was written by lawyers. Uh, so it's not necessarily written to be computable. So we did a lot of manual, tedious work to take a legal contract and then decompose it into computable rules. But the same kinds of uh, techniques that you use to break down code in that previous example, you could also use to break down legal contracts. Here's another sort of interesting thing that we found when we were doing this work, is that it really doesn't take a whole lot of modification to a legal contract to make it computable. Um, so, uh, you know, for the attorneys uh, out there, uh, you are very close, actually, to having something that, that is computable. So we finally were able to uh, take the contracts, and, and the reason this is complicated is because this firm, their, their, their clauses in how they make revenue out of drilling an oil well is you get, a, you get a little bonus if you maintain a certain pressure. You get a little bonus if you drill so many feet per day, and all of these exotic sort of rules and clauses, we had to um, make computable in order to compute the real-time revenue. So when we finally did that, it looks something like this. So now you've got a drill bit going down into the earth, and then it goes down so far, and then it comes back out, and it goes back down again, and it comes back out. But you can see on that right-hand side of the display, we're showing how much we are making, the green line, how much we're spending, the red line. So we were able to do something that they previously had not been able to do, which is juxtapose the financial information against the operational inf information in real time. Think of it as a profit and loss statement at the, the drill bit. And the enabling methodology, the enabling technology that made that happen was to take code, contract, and turn it into something computable. So, you know, we were really excited when we were able to sort of finally do this um, because if, if you sort of broaden your definition of what is data, it makes these kinds of uh, applications possible. Okay, so it's going to go through sort of 39 days of drilling. I used to always think that when you drilled a well, it was like sort of Jed Clampett, you know, firing the gun and the oil just sort of spurts out of the ground. It's not, they said, George, that's not exactly how it works. You, you drill a certain amount, and then you come out and you drill back in again. So it's a it's, for this, it was a very uh, complex set of processes that took place over 39 days. But 
Interestingly, that, that whole uh, idea uh, came about because we were able to apply this sort of um, code as data notion. And the, the other thing that I'm, I'm seeing, and maybe you're seeing as well, is the emergence of these graph databases and ontologies. So um, instead of uh, treating uh, data as just sort of structured data in some Cartesian kind of data set, but actually building an ontology, building, Dr. Wolfram mentioned this earlier, you know, building a sort of an ontology of here are the objects in my world, and here's what attributes they have, and here's what, you know, what they're capable of doing. I think this data as code, excuse me, this code as data idea has the uh, potential to allow us to automatically build ontologies. And that's, I think, is the holy grail in this whole equation, is if we can automate these currently tedious human processes of taking a body of knowledge and making it computable. I mean, right now, it's, it, it is very uh, manually intensive. And I think that's holding back a lot of the applications of this from being economically feasible uh, because they're not automated. But the emergence of ontologies allows us then to uh, perhaps grab a, a bunch of information that just exists in its natural form and putting that into a federated kind of database. All right, so that's enough about the, the code as data idea. Let's look at data as code now. Oops, skipping around. All right, so the, the central idea behind <clears throat> data as code is thinking about code existing in a database itself. You know, when we think about code, we think of these big sort of monolithic uh, systems with, with millions of lines of code, and that's, that's in fact, the most common um, state that, that this code exists in. But what if you had uh, code fragments that were actually in data? What if you could recall those code fragments and build them or run them on the fly? You know, what, what would that do? I mean, certainly one of the things that we can think about, that, and this was a, this was a real application, a, a sort of application concept that, uh, that somebody proposed to me, which is, you know, think about your car. I mean, there's a lot of software in your car right now. And you use your car in all different kinds of places. Uh, sometimes the weather is this. Sometimes the location is that. So, so the car really should react. It's, it's traction system. It's braking system. It really should react to all of those kinds of conditions. So you've got sort of a couple of choices here as a designer of the system. One is you could build this just huge amount of code that accounts for every possible uh, weather condition, location, altitude, or you could actually keep a lot of that code in a searchable sort of database. So essentially, the car pulls its code together, compiles it, and runs it as, as it's going. And uh, a, a very real application of that is some work that we recently did where we were working with a chemical plant. And the chemical plant had uh, yield equations for the chemical processes. They were making nylon. So this is stuff that, that uh, starts with uh, you know, things like ammonia and crude oil and sort of puts them together, reacts them in certain ways over lots and lots and lots of steps and ultimately produces this nylon product. Well, those yields vary, you know, much like the car example, those yields vary by temperature and time of day and the quality of the raw material. There's this huge number of, of variations. So again, we could have chosen to put the big sort of switch statement at the very top of our code. If all of these conditions are present, then do this. Otherwise, if these conditions are present, then do this. It was much easier from a design standpoint, to put all of those little code fragments, those, those yield equations, into a database. And you're seeing uh, just sort of a spreadsheet of some of these equations coming up. And it had this sort of the handy byproduct of allowing the company also to um, change those equations outside of the core code, which is a, an important, I think, capability. So I've been kind of watching applications in this space 
And one of the interesting uh, applications that you, you may have seen is called Viv. So the, the original sort of Siri team um, reconstituted themselves over into this company called Viv. And they gave an, an interview in Wired Magazine last year. And they talked about Viv. And it is essentially this intelligent agent, uh, not unlike Siri, that uh, responds to certain requests. So um, they, they say, uh, you know, I, I won't read the whole quote here, but he says, Viv breaks through the constraints of coding and, and programming by generating its own code on the fly. Now, I, I don't know anything about the internal architecture of Viv, but what I'm noticing in the work that I do and kind of the research that I'm trying to do in thinking about this is that I'm seeing statements like this out in the media a lot more frequently, this notion of sort of coding on the fly. So what Viv does is it processes a, a, a statement like, on my way to my brother's house, I need to pick up some cheap wine that goes well with lasagna. And then they go on to kind of break that. They show you how uh, Viv actually sort of breaks all of this down. And um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a fascinating little application. I, I think that's, that's less important than the central idea here, which is that we have um, the ability to then start putting these systems together that actually program themselves, if you will, because they have at their disposal some database of code fragments that they bring in only as needed. And then last but not least, I'll sort of uh, conclude on this, this situation, which is IFTTT. Now, I'd like a raise of hands. How many of you ever heard of IFTTT or IFT? Okay, great, so many of you have, that's, that's good. If you haven't heard about it, you need to, because I think this is really a, a, an extraordinary kind of capability. IFT stands for if this, then that. And it's, a, it's an application framework that allows you to take apps and essentially build scripts around these apps. So some people have, for example, said, you know, every time I take a photo of my pet, Ralph, um, then I want you to take that photo and post it automatically on Facebook. Or every time uh, my wife goes to the grocery store, I want to get an email message that she's at the grocery store. Or people have, are even starting to outfit their cars with these little devices that fit into the diagnostic port um, that then say, if my car, and, and I'm terrible at this, I can never remember when to rotate the tires of my car. So I come to the tire dealer and they say, oh, your tires are shredded. So um, I'd like to get one of these devices and have it tell me if my car is ready to be, the tires are ready to be rotated, send me some kind of message that notifies me. So you can essentially put together any range of apps and it supports like 150 apps uh, out there that you can use to trigger some of these common actions. It's, it, like I say, it's a, a extremely important sort of category of application that we haven't thought of um, up to now. And here's the even better news that Wolfram Research, thank you very much, Wolfram Research has now built a, uh, a channel, as, as uh, IFT calls it, of Wolfram Data Drop. So now you can have a data drop out there that's collecting information from you know, any device you want. You know, go, go to the connected devices uh, list and you'll see all those devices. So, uh, in theory, any of those devices might qualify for, for connecting to a data drop that then you can have it trigger some other kind of action. Um, so that's for a lot of consumer applications, but think of the industrial applications of something like connecting an, an if this, then that sort of capability to things that, that happen inside of, uh, of corporations. I think that a lot more to come. This was just released last week. I, I'm not sure exactly which day it was released on, but there have been a couple of posts where people have, have uh, built applications based on Wolfram Data Drop. One of the applications uh, was a, a gentleman who put together an app that showed his elevation. So he had his phone track his elevation as he was sort of hiking in a certain area, and he later looked at a list plot of all of the, the elevations that he had been uh, throughout the day. So the, the, you know, the mind just kind of races uh, for uh, applications uh, you know, that you can do with, with some of this. Um, okay, so 
essentially my, my message to you is really uh, the singular message that you know, if we sort of broaden our thoughts on what constitutes data, if we broaden our thoughts on what constitutes code, um, lots and lots of applications are unlocked. And you know, sometimes when we got, get caught up in a sort of everyday world of working with this same sort of or similar Cartesian data sets over and over again, um, it, we, we need to sort of take time and step back and say, you know, if we, if we sort of change our definitions of what comprises those things, it sort of unlocks our thinking in um, how we approach data. And um, uh, in the shameless plug department, I've written uh, a, a book sort of on the subject about um, you know, sort of solving problems and how you might solve uh, problems using data, using scientific methods. Um, and that's, that's uh, just to be released. But there's a chapter on data where I expand on a lot of these ideas. And so with that, I'll conclude and I'll take whatever questions you might have.